I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you episode number 54 in this podcast, dedicated to the betterment of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. This is going to be, I I believe, our second ever holiday-themed episode. We're going to be celebrating the American holiday Thanksgiving in just a couple days here. And Thanksgiving, of course, is associated with turkeys, and turkey meat is associated with L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid, one of, I believe, 20 amino acids that's strung together within our cellular machinery to make up proteins. And tryptophan actually has some fairly direct effects on our neurotransmitter levels, particularly serotonin. So we're going to be speaking with a tryptophan expert whose name I'm unfortunately almost for sure I'm going to butcher. He is a Frenchman, although living in Australia, Dr. Gilles Guillemin, and he has been studying tryptophan and its effects within the body for the last 17 years, so is a heavyweight expert in this particular chemical. Now, if you hang around until the end of the episode, I'm going to tell you something that you can pull out of your bag of tricks to impress your friends and family members at Thanksgiving, which is how one should refer to a group of turkeys. It's probably not what you think. I didn't know this. This is actually something that was tossed at me by my editor prior to us editing this episode. It was so cool that I figured out, well, let's get that in there. But before we get into any of that, let's do This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts. This Week in Neuroscience. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to do this without being overly preachy or more moralistic because there's one thing that nobody likes is preachy moralistic people. But it is the holidays. It's a time of year that is well known for excessive consumption of alcohol and that has some nasty effects like more car accidents and things like that every single year. But alcohol is also doing a lot of damage which can go unseen within people's brains even if nothing as dramatic as a car accident results from it. A new study that's going to be published in the December 2014 issue of Alcoholism Clinical and Experimental Research goes into detail on a study that was just completed at Harvard University and the Boston University School of Medicine. They were looking at gray matter and white matter within the brain. One of the lead researchers, Catherine Braun-Fortier, describes gray matter and white matter thus. Gray matter or cortex consisting of neurons, the critical cells that support brain function, and white matter, the connections among large groups of those cells. We now know that alcohol impacts both gray matter and white matter with the greatest impact affecting the parts of the brain called the frontal lobes. These brain areas are critical for learning new information and even more importantly, in self-regulation, impulse control, and the modification of all complicated behaviors. In other words, the very parts of the brain that may be most important for controlling problem drinking are damaged by alcohol, and the more alcohol consumed, the greater the damage. One interesting and somewhat bleak finding with this study is that it really does seem to be a dose-dependent negative response to alcohol. It's not something where you either have brain damage or you don't. It seems to be very much a sliding scale just based on the amount of alcohol that's abused. Says Fortier, alcohol is more like a sunburn. Our study shows that the damage occurs as a function of quantity and exposure. The more you drink, the greater the damage to key structures of the brain, such as the inferior frontal gyrus in particular. This part of the brain mediates inhibitory control and decision-making, so tragically, it appears that some of the areas of the brain that are most affected by alcohol are important for self-control and judgment, the very things needed to recover from misuse of alcohol. This study was based on brain scans of men and women, some of whom were alcoholics, some of whom were sort of light, regular drinkers, essentially people that consumed alcohol but not at, at what's considered a problem level. The mean age of the alcoholic group was 51, and the control group was matched to the alcoholic group with regard to gender, age, education, and estimated intelligence. One interesting finding was that people who were alcoholics who had stopped drinking and had been able to successfully stop, if they ceased alcohol use before a threshold age, which seems to be about 50 based on the study, then their brains were able to partially recover. Beyond the age of 50, it seemed like the physiological infrastructure wasn't even really there to repair the damage, even if somebody stopped drinking beyond that point. So not great news for the alcohol industry. Not that this is probably going to make people stop drinking in droves, but definitely does not paint a pretty picture of what alcohol is doing inside the human brain. So drink response as they say during the holidays, and really recognize that responsible doesn't just mean not running over somebody in a car. It can really mean thinking about what's going to be best for your own long-term health and cognition. Smart Drug Smarts. And a couple pieces of Smart Drug Smarts news. The most enthusiastic email of the week award goes to JT Olson, who said of our app, Axon, I have almost 200 apps on my phone, and by far this is my favorite. It's packed with useful information. I was, uh, I mean, I was 
on the one hand, of course, we love getting that email. It's like, but I'm I'm a little bit afraid that we're going to give JT a complete heart attack when he sees where the app's going to go in the course of the next six months because uh, we're, we're just just getting started, buddy. But really, really appreciate the email. And for those of you who are iOS users who have not yet downloaded Axon, I will politely nudge you in that direction. Also on the Smart Drug Smarts website, I actually just wrote an article. I don't, I don't really do much article writing on the site, which is something I'd kind of like to get more in the habit of doing that because I, I do enjoy writing articles from time to time. But I've been goofing around with my sleep habits for the last couple of months. I've been trying to up my number of naps pretty significantly throughout the day. And I want to get another sleep episode in here sometime soon because the more I think about it, the more I just think that sleep hacking is like one of the biggest potential wins if you can do something to improve your quality of sleep. But anyway, I, I'm not going to get into it right now. But new little article that I wrote dealing with a sleep hack that I've been fiddling with. That's up on the Smart Drug Smarts website. It's called Hypnagogic Harvests of a Sputtering Brain. Giamine from the Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He's got one of these amazing French accents that just kind of makes you wish you were French. And among other things, we're going to be speaking about the French paradox, which uh, he refers to that a couple times in the interview. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows what the French paradox is. It's a term that was sort of popularized in the late 1980s, which deals with the counterintuitive fact that while French people have a diet that's rich in saturated fats with lots of heavy sauces and butters and things like that, they have a relatively low incidence of coronary disease and heart attacks and circulatory problems that we typically associate with high-fat diets. And what science has come to accept is at least one of the clues in that mystery is a substance called resveratrol, which the French consume a lot of in their red wines. It's also present in some other foods like blueberries have a lot of resveratrol. It's probably deserving of an episode unto itself in a future Smart Drug Smarts. But yeah, anyway, just sort of wanted to give you a little bit of the cheat sheet for some of the terms that are going to be bandied about here. So the mythology of L-tryptophan and Thanksgiving goes something like this. Turkey meat is particularly high in L-tryptophan, and so when people get together and eat Thanksgiving meals that have turkey meat in them, everybody gets tired after the meal because something about L-tryptophan makes you sleepy. Turns out that's not particularly accurate, and the, the first hole in that is just that Turkey meat isn't really all that high in tryptophan compared to plenty of other things. And that's kind of where we kick off the interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So you're right. Basically, it's a misconception because the, uh, among the different type of food, uh, the turkey is pretty low or say in the middle of in terms of concentration of tryptophan. The highest meat, the highest thing you can find tryptophan is the sea lion meat. We don't eat sea lions every day, but that's the highest, that's the highest one. I don't know why it's like that, but probably because... You know, you need a lot of energy on to put it from the cold or whatever. After that, you have the elk meat. Among the food we, we eat every day, one of the richest food in tryptophan is a white egg. Egg white, sorry. So it's about one gram per one hundred gram of, of uh, food. Spirulina is pretty rich as well. But when you look about the turkey itself, when you look between the different poultry, turkey are even only fourth. The number one is quail. Number two is duck, number three is pheasant, and number four is turkey. So it's it's rich in tryptophan, but not that rich. So where do you think that this sort of mythology around turkeys and tryptophan, how did that come to be? You should be able to answer that. It's an American legend, so I'm not too sure. We don't eat that much turkey in Europe or in Australia, so uh, I, I don't know where it's coming from, uh, the original story about. It's funny because a couple of years ago, I had already an interview from a, a newspaper in, in US. They contacted me as well, said, oh, is it dangerous to eat too much turkey? You know, on falling asleep while driving, say, oh, I don't think so. I think you have to eat a lot of turkey before before you fall asleep. It's more what's coming with the turkey. I think what you're drinking with the turkey, maybe. Let's roll back to our basic biochemistry 101 and sort of tell us what tryptophan is in the broader context. Tryptophan is one of the, the 20 amino acid. It's an essential amino acid. So that means our body cannot make it. The only way to have it in your in our protein in our body is to get it from the diet. So. It's, a, it's an amino acid. It's like a piece of Lego you will use to make your protein. A protein is a co- combination of different amino acids, like you're building a Lego with different colors, uh, blocks. Tryptophan is just one of these blocks. And it's very important for a lot of small molecules in your brain. Uh, we'll probably discuss that a bit later about, you know, the uh, neuroactive compound like serotonin, melatonin. Tryptophan is, is a precursor of this kind of molecule. It's really important in your body. Tell us about that, what the effects on our neurochemistry are that result from the consumption of tryptophan. And I know that tryptophan is often talked about as being a metabolic metabolite of 5-HTP, which is a supplement that a lot of people are probably familiar with, which, and 5-HTP in turn affects the serotonin levels within the brain. Yes. So tryptophan has 
two pathways. It can be used by two different pathways. The first thing has two branches. One branch called the, uh, the serotonergic pathway, where the tryptophan will be broken to make 5-hydroxytryptophan, 5-HT, to make serotonin and make melatonin. Or the other branch is called the kynorinin pathway, which has been I've been working on for 17 years on this pathway. And uh, this pathway is mostly used to make an essential coenzyme called nicotinamide adenine uh, dinucleotide, called NAD+, which is a very, very essential cofactor in your body. It's used, it's, it's an anti-aging. We just recently demonstrated that it's very, very important for anti-aging because, for example, the um, aging, uh, the genes in your body regulating your aging called the sirtuins, they cannot work without NAD. That's a branch of the canine pathway branch. The other branch is the serotonin. So it's, make, it's making serotonin in normal condition that's regulating your mood. When the serotonin is catabolized, it's making melatonin. Melatonin is regulating your sleep. And does the creation of melatonin, would that have something to do with the drowsiness effects that people associate with the big turkeys at the Thanksgiving dinners? Or is that a, a wild goose chase to keep on the poultry analogy? No, I think it's not the case. Because if, if you take supplement of tryptophan, you will not sleep. You know that the conversion from serotonin to melatonin is regulated by light as well. So... In your different system regulating uh, by small molecules, it, way in, in, when you have light, your brain sees the light, it only makes serotonin, and when you're in the dark, you will, uh, you will increase your, your melatonin. Is this one of these things where if you wanted to take it at night but still get the effects of serotonin, that buying one of these like blue lights that's giving daytime wavelength of light would be useful to somebody? Like, Is there a, a hack there? Oh, that's a very good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to this one. Uh, I know that people are working on the regulatory mechanism. There is a tryptophan metabolite, which is light sensitive, called uh, formil endolocarbazole. The short name is uh, FIGZ. And it is binding one of the receptors called aryl uh, hydrocarbon receptor. And it's probably the mechanism of regulation of the day or night, on, or regulating as well your circadian rhythms. It's called FIGZ. Fix, fix uh, but that's still in, uh, people are working still on, the, on this story. On this small molecule. Tell us a little bit about the NAD+. Yeah, the NAD is really important, actually. And maybe you have heard about the work from David Sinclair. He was one of the guys, he's one of the guys from Harvard. He's working on resveratrol, a natural compound. And he's, he's, he, he has been named one of the top scientists or t in Time Magazine or something like that last year or this year. This work showed that basically what the resveratrol, you know, the basic of the French paradox does, it increases NAD plus in your body. And NAD+, plus, again, is very important for uh, the sirtuin activity, the anti-aging genes. So it's truly really essential. This NAD+, plus is so important for so many things in your body, like uh, DNA repair to limit cancer development, increasing energy. If you take, the more you increase your NAD level, your, the more your every single cell in your body will make energy, ATP. So it's an essential, really essential coenzyme. That's why, basically, this, this tryptophan metabolism is so important as a source of NAD+. Plus. I've read that there's some differences between tryptophan when it's consumed in the diet versus when it's taken as a supplement, that supplements do more to increase brain levels of serotonin versus eating tryptophan. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, actually, to penetrate the brain, blood-brain barrier and get inside the brain tryptophan, there is a transporter called uh, LAT1, low amino acid transporter 1. To reach the brain, there is a competition between several amino acids. So if you only take one, like if you only take tryptophan, it will be the only one basically going to the door. If you, if you have a big meal with a lot of different amino acids, they will compete. They will compete you know, they with, a, they with a limitation for the, uh, the, the going, getting through this, this transporter. And that's simply this reason. Is if you get a pure, only one amino acid high dose, it will go straight away to your brain. Where are the full meal? It's a competition between uh, different amino acids to enter the brain. That's as simple as that. Can you talk about neurotransmitter levels and tryptophan in the diet? You mentioned earlier about the 5-hydroxytryptophan. It's, if it's a good thing to take tryptophan or 5-hydroxytryptophan when you have a, a, a mood problem or thing like that. And I, I would believe that it's probably better to go straight away to 5-hydroxytryptophan because you cannot go back to the other pathway, canine pathway, and you cannot make the, the, the toxin quinonic acid. So if you, if you take 5-hydroxytryptophan, you can, your brain will be only able to make 
serotonin or melatonin. So if you have the choice, it's also what people ask me, say, if you have the choice between tryptophan and on 5-HT, 5-HT-tryptophan, I will probably take, if it's to target your mood problem or depression or whatever, I would probably go to 5 hct tryptophan And there are some natural products you can buy some, uh, there is a plant from, uh, I think from Brazil or from Amazonia called uh, Griffonia simplif- uh, simplicifolia. And it's really, really rich in 5-HT. If you don't want to take any drug, just take the natural compound. Is there any appreciable difference between the chemically synthesized version of 5-HTP and what one would get from the plant? Not really, no. That's the same molecule, but some, a lot of people prefer natural compound, and I'm a bit like that. And uh, it has the same effect. You know, I've, I've, I've been testing a lot of different uh, molecules to, uh, as enzyme inhibitor of the tryptophan metabolism. When sometimes I compare natural products versus the chemical, I found that the natural compound actually has this, at, at least the same activity and there are no toxicity at all. So I didn't believe before, but now I'm really you know, like a believer in this kind of molecules. It was, it's impressive. When you see the result under your microscope on your cells, they say, wow, it's working. And if it's a drug, you know, it will take years to reach the patient. But if it's a natural compound, it comes under no Neutraceutical, so you can you can reach the patient much faster as well. And we generally think of serotonin in the brain as being a good thing, of having you know antidepressant properties and things like that. But is, is that an overly simplistic analogy? There is a, a term at the moment about this story about serotonin. That's really another very good question. For, for many years, people have been treated with uh, serotonin, you know, drug targeting serotonin level or things like that. And only a small percentage of these people uh, respond to these kind of drugs. More recently, I think over the last two or three years, people are like like uh, some groups in the US have been uh, doing an amazing work showing that another molecule deriving from tryptophan called quinolinic acid is actually activating some uh, specific receptor on neurons. And that's uh, that this, this toxin actually is deriving from tryptophan who is responsible for depression and suicidal behavior, actually. Serotonin is turning as a second second base now. It's just not the the, the main guy. It's, a second, it's number two now. A lot of people um, yeah, have, been, have been trying to to identify what was the process. And over the last two or three years, some some very exciting results from different countries and Sweden and US have shown that actually quinolinic acid activating NMDA receptor on, on neurons is probably the main cause of depression on suicidal behavior. That's one of those things. It makes you think back like evolutionarily of if it's as simple as that. That if there's one compound within the brain that can make an organism want to take its own life, it's like, how the heck did that survive in the gene pool? It seems like that would be the kind of thing that evolution would have weeded out of the system a long, long time ago, unless there was some second order benefit for having a, a very minute amount or something. You're wondering why, why the human body, like the, the immune cell making this toxin, it's one, it's, it's one of their weapons, actually. They, they use it to kill a, a parasite or bacteria or thing like that. And in, in a normal condition, this molecule is not a toxin. If you reach... At low level, it's a good thing because it, it's a substrate to make, coming back to the same story, to, come in, to make NAD+. Plus. Because as soon as you have inflammation, that's another story. In, in depression, you have a basic on chronic inflammation in your brain. With the time, it's what happening. You have this toxin building, building on building, on stimulating your neurons. It's a long-term effect and it's, it's a chronic effect. And you know that's uh, recently the same thing that people have discovered that Ketamine, uh, this uh, this recreational drugs, actually, it's a very potent antidepressor. On what ketamine does, ketamine blocks the receptor where quinolinic acid binds. What, what are the physiological downsides of ketamine? I, I assume there probably are some. Yes, it's, it's like any drug because any drug is it's active, overactivating your neurons, basically, binding on a receptor on your neuron and overstimulating your neuron. You get, that's why you get this, this effect. So if you take too much, you will uh, overstimulate your neuron and sometimes you damage them and sometimes you damage them irreversibly and they die. So, you know, in long term, long term exposure to some of the drug, basically, you start to have memory problem and things like that. So ketamine can be dangerous as well. One I think in important as a moment you asked me what what can be relevant as well a lot of people are working on, on using this tryptophan metabolism as uh, therapeutic as well or biomarker because uh, for example the um, actually the any cancer they use tryptophan metabolism to switch off the immune response to protect themselves it's 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 basically any type of cancer I work on glioblastoma uh, prostate cancer a lot of different cancer use the tryptophan metabolism to stop. Uh, the immune response to to attack them. So a lot of people are, are trying to basically to switch off this system from inside the tumor to unmask the tumor to the immune system and getting destroyed. That's a very new topic, very interesting topic as well. The tryptophan metabolites from the canine pathway, they are very, very, very potent immunomodulator. 
this has been discovered by a group, a couple of American scientists, Moon and Miller. They saw that during pregnancy, what is protecting the fetus from the immune system of the mother? They are trypt tryptophan metabolite deriving from the tryptophan. So it's really important during the pregnancy to have the right amount of tryptophan because your placenta, the woman placenta, will, will, will metabolize tryptophan to make some small molecule to protect the fetus from the immune system of the mother. If you block the enzyme making this small molecule, you, in, in, within hours, you can see the immune system of the mother penetrating the placenta and going to destroy the fetus. That raises an interesting question for women that are vegetarians or on other sort of low-protein diets while they're pregnant. Is that a cause for concern? Actually, that's, you know, when you have this, what the, uh, the recommended daily allowance for for, no, for people is about, what, 10 milligrams per day of tryptophan. Women, they always need a little bit more, especially when they're pregnant, actually. They need at least almost, they need double into about 20 milligrams per day. But they can get that from milk. They can, if, if they are vegetarian, they can get get from spirulina or they can get from spinach, pretty rich in tryptophan as well. But I think tryptophan is really important during the pregnancy. I'm aware of, about the Japanese study. They gave a very high dose of tryptophan to pregnant women and they couldn't see any you know, bad effect on uh, the woman or the development of the fetus on everything. So that's, even if you increase your daily um, intake of tryptophan during pregnancy, they didn't find any problem with the development of the, the, the baby or nothing like that. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you very much to Dr. Giamine for shedding some light on tryptophan and its many related compounds. Also, something that we, it was on the cutting room floor of the interview, but I want to make sure that it snuck in here somewhere. What's the deal with the L in L-tryptophan? We often hear L-tryptophan, but in that interview, we were using the term interchangeably with tryptophan. Turns out that the L, when you hear the capital letter L in front of an amino acid, is the free form of the amino acid. It means it's not attached to other amino acids with peptide bonds forming the chain that we know as a protein. So you connect some tryptophanes to any other amino acid, you make a protein out of them, it ceases to be an L-tryptophan. At that point, it's just a tryptophan. But when it's eaten and digested by your body, broken down by your digestive enzymes, you wind up with L-tryptophan, which can make it through your gut, into your bloodstream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, to keep on the theme of turkeys, our ruthless listener retention gimmick. Smart drug smarts. Ruthless listener retention gimmick. Okay, so you know how different animals come in groups. You have flocks of birds and packs of wolves and things like that. Apparently, turkeys, there's three choices that you can do when you're referring to a group of turkeys. Two of which are, well, they're, they're all weird. Turkeys come in posses, like a group of guys going out to hunt somebody down in the Wild West. Turkeys can be referred to that way. Turkeys also come in gangs. And finally, turkeys come in rafters, which I guess is like a group of turkeys sitting on the rafter of a barn where that term originated from. But I really like the idea of posses and gangs of turkeys. So there's a bit of Thanksgiving trivia for you. We'll put up a link actually to the website where we found this, which is a listing site for a bunch of different weird animal groupings. My favorite was a Congress of Salamanders. Salamanders apparently come in Congresses. Who knew? Smart Drug Smarts. The podcast so smart, we have smart in our title. Twice. So thank you very much for hanging out until the end of the episode. This is the end, but I think that you're now in a great position to be sort of the reigning champion within your family on the biochemistry of L-tryptophan and your Thanksgiving meal. So when somebody pulls out the little, I know why you're all getting sleepy card, I'm sure that the first thing you're going to say is, well, if we were eating sea lion meat instead of turkey meat, maybe you'd be right, Uncle Ned, but... And then when everybody backs off in shock and awe and wonders where you got that awesome scientific knowledge, I hope that you take the time to tell them about the Smart Drug Smarts podcast and our associated website, smartdrugsmarts.com, where you will find links to everything that we talked about here. I will be back at you next week with a non-holiday themed episode. And apologies to everybody listening who's not American and couldn't give two craps about Thanksgiving, but it will be a little bit more cosmopolitan and universally applicable again next week with episode number 55 about a subject which I will not yet reveal. Until then, have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.